let us begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, let the words of my mouth, let the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength, my rock, and my redeemer. So speak, Lord, for your people are listening in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Also want to give a shout out to my baby girl, Hannah. She's joining us from Thunderbird at Venice Academy. So we're grateful to have her with us here today as well. So we're going to start our message today. At his death, he was the youngest recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in history. He was the first African American to be honored on the National Mall. He was assassinated on April the 4th, 1968 by James Earl Ray. Martin Luther King used nonviolence and civil disobedience in order to promote civil rights for all Americans in general, but to African Americans in particular. Although he died violently and prematurely, by an assassin's bullet, his dream could not be killed. And our text today demonstrates how people that you would least likely find are able to overcome their own personal obstacles. This individual who receives a dream from God is arrested about his own issues. It will serve as a revelation and a warning to all of us today. So this morning, I'm using the title, The Wounded Healer. The Wounded Healer. For those of you who have your Bibles, your devices, if you will swipe or turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, and we are going to begin, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 10, we're going to begin at verse 1, Acts chapter 10, starting at verse 1. I'm going to be reading this morning from the Holman Christian Standard Bible, Acts chapter 10, starting at verse 1, and our message today is coming largely from this particular chapter. Again, Acts chapter 10, starting at verse 1. I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. It records, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently, about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, I'm sorry, I'm reading from the wrong version here. I apologize. I was in the King James, but I'm, I'm back. I'm back here. The angel told him, your prayers and your acts of charity have come up as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for Simon, who is also named Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, he called two of his household slaves and a devout soldier who was one of those who attended him. After explaining everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Our first character in this story is none other than Cornelius. Just by his name, we know that he is probably Greek or Roman by nature because it's a Greek name in that culture. He is a devout man of God, the Bible declares, a man that fears God. And not only that, he is a generous man. He is a man of prayer. And he is a man that has God's undivided attention because of his generosity to the poor, because of his continual devotion and prayer to God. God 
sends an angel to Cornelius. It's as if God cannot be, uh, he, he's being disturbed by the prayers that keeps coming up from Cornelius. It's, it's almost as if God wants to declare, what does this man want? He's constantly at my door. His prayers continue to ascend on a regular basis. He then commissions an angel, go and go and talk to Cornelius. Let him know I've got something for him. And the angel instructs him to ask for a person by the name of Peter. He's at Simon, who is a tanner's house, and he is to send emissaries to bring Peter to himself. Well, as the story continues, as you know, Peter is there, and he's on a rooftop, and I guess food is being prepared, and he is lying on the rooftop hungry. I can imagine if you're hungry, that's not the place you want to be because all of that fragrance, all of the smell of the food is rising right there at the top. While Peter is waiting for the meal to be served, he can smell all the spices and all the food that's being kicked up, and he's hungry. But he goes into a trance or a sleep because he has a dream or a vision. And in this vision or dream, he sees sheets that are going up that are filled with unclean animals. And then he hears a voice that Peter says is coming from heaven. And he tells him, Peter, rise up, kill and eat. But Peter refuses vigorously. Oh no, I have never ever eaten anything common or unclean. And Peter makes this boy, this boast to the voice that is calling him from heaven. Three times he declares, I will not. I've never done that. I don't eat anything common or anything that is unclean. But you know what? This narrative begs a question. Why would Peter so vigorously disobey a heavenly voice? a heavenly voice. Peter has seen Jesus minister to those who Jews would categorically see or view as unclean. Jesus has healed lepers. Jesus has driven out demons from individuals. Jesus has even had the unmitigated goal to heal a Roman soldier, someone who is of an occupying army in Jerusalem. So why would Peter not obey this heavenly voice? Well, Peter's refusal to obey this voice is only the symptom of a deeper problem. You see, at the heart of Peter's problem is his prejudice. See, Peter must be confronted with his own prejudice against Gentiles. See, prejudice simply means to be prejudged based on one's own biases. But what makes prejudice so dangerous is that we don't judge people based on the content of their character. We base them on their skin or we base them on their culture. And this is exactly what Peter is being confronted with. Because see, Peter's prejudice runs, his, its roots run into pride. Pride is where this prejudice is birthed from. Because pride is an insidious poison concocted in the laboratory of hell. It is what led to Lucifer making a devil out of himself. Pride. And we have all been infected with pride at the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. Ellen White puts it this way. There is nothing so offensive to God or so dangerous to the human soul as pride and self-sufficiency. Of all the sins, it is the most hopeless, the most incurable. Christ's Object Lessons, page 154. See, Peter's pride and his prejudice is based on his privilege in the first century. 
In the first century, a Jew would get up in the morning and in his prayer to God, he would thank God for three things. First, he would thank God that he was male and not female in the first century. He would thank God that he was a Jew and not a Gentile. He had favorite status with God in his own mind. And lastly, he would thank God that he was free and not a slave. These were the things that a Jew would thank God for the first thing in the morning. Peter's privilege in the first century made his privilege invisible because he, after all, was part of God's chosen people. So he has never eaten anything unclean. But if you read the narrative carefully, the Bible is very clear. Peter does not understand the vision. He's still thinking about it. He's pondering about it when the knock comes to the door. So those who say, hey, Peter's vision declares that we can eat anything we want is not true. Because the vision has nothing to do with food and has everything to do with how Peter views people as common and unclean. And the challenges that Peter is facing in his day, many are facing today. Folks, the word of God says there is nothing new under the sun. Nothing new. And some of the same old tactics the enemy has used in the past and that he has used successfully have been recycled even in our day. So the question now is, how is Jesus going to heal Peter of his own prejudice against Gentiles? Well, I'm glad you asked the question. Jesus is going to force Peter to face it. He is going to come face to face with his own issues when Jesus will send him to Cornelius. You know, they arrive there and they're asking for, is Peter there? And they want Peter to come. And Peter understands now that he must go with them because the same voice of heaven that was talking about rise up and eat now tells Peter that he is to go. And Peter goes. So Peter has some understanding about this voice that he's hearing from heaven because in one moment he rejects the voice, but now in this moment he accepts the voice and now he goes. Well, Peter is now going to be faced with his own issue of prejudice, particularly against Gentiles. And folks, let me be clear here. Prejudice is not a one-way street. Prejudice goes both ways. I don't care who it is and who you are. When we prejudge people, we engage in prejudice, we engage in bias. And may I suggest to you, prejudice is a major hindrance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the only solution is God needs us to have an attitude adjustment. Because here's the reality. We all have biases. We all have them. We all have preferences. And to say I'm not biased and to say I, I don't have preferences, it's not to be honest. We all do. And there's nothing wrong with having biases and having preferences. But if you allow them to then prejudge other people, that's when it becomes problematic. And unfortunately for many of us, our very own biases are unconscious to us. You know, the sad reality is sociologists who have studied this declare to us, and it is not a compliment, it is a glaring indictment to the people of God, that the church, the institution, is still one of the most segregated institutions in America, the church of God. And it is unfortunate because we ought to be a microcosm. You know what happened at Pentecost. People from all over the world accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ from all nations, from all ethnicities, from all races. They were called into the birth of the Christian church. And yet we still find our churches today as one of the most segregated institutions in America. 
So watch this now. God is going to have to do for some of us what he does with Peter. Peter is then confronted. Peter arrives at Cornelius' house. And when he gets there, he recognizes he's there. He's there with a group of Gentiles waiting to receive this Jew. Now, you have to understand the culture. A Jew would not even go under the home of the shadow of someone who was a Gentile because that would make him unclean. And so he has to break from his cultural norms in order to do what God has said to do. He's got to violate his deepest instincts and he goes into this home and he finds that God has a group of people waiting to receive him. Can you imagine this? When he gets there to Cornelius' house, expecting to uh, talk to Cornelius because his emissaries have said, hey, this guy is a friend of the synagogue. He's a friend of the Jewish people. He loves our God and he wants you to come and see as if they're trying to persuade him to come because they also understand there is this barrier. There is this obstacle in, in order for this Jew to go to the home of this Gentile. And when Peter gets there, not only does he find find Cornelius. He finds his whole household there ready to hear a message from God through Peter. I'm sure Peter is taken aback. I'm sure Peter is shocked and amazed that they are there to hear a word from God. So God forces Peter to move, watch this now, out of his comfort zone. He has moved out of his comfort zone into a place of uncomfortableness. He is there in the home of a Gentile and not only there to see Cornelius, he sees there's a whole group of people there ready to hear the word of God. And I can imagine the inner conflict of Peter because he's in the home of a Gentile, but Peter remembers what happened the last time he preached Thousands join the church. And if you're an evangelist and you walk into a home with people ready to hear the word of God, it's almost too good to be true. What will Peter do in this moment? Peter has an aha moment. He says, hey, I now get it. I now understand what God was trying to communicate to me. That God is not a respecter of persons. That I, I cannot call anything that belongs to God common and unclean. Peter's learning, hey, I've got to learn to love all people and to respect all people, irrespective of their culture, their, their, their ethnicity, or, or their color. Cornelius is a Roman. He's Italian. He's a part of an occupying army to keep Jerusalem in check. But hey, this same Peter, this same Peter, the one who said to Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This same Peter who was told to go and make disciples of all nations. This same Peter who preached on Pentecost and thousands were saved. This same Peter whose very shadow brought healing to the sick was sick himself. Peter, I submit to you, was a wounded healer and God wanted to heal him of his woundedness, and he used ministry to do it. Peter was a wounded healer, and God would use Cornelius to heal Peter. Wow, when you think about it, we are all wounded. We've all been born in sin. We've all been shaped in iniquity. As a matter of fact, I suggest to you, when we come into the world, we're born bent, bent toward being evil. It's in our fallen nature. 
And it's only because and by the grace of God that we become a new creature. Because if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. Behold, all things have become new. The old things have been cast away. We need a transformation. We need a blood transfusion to become what God has called us to be. It's the only way. It's the only way. God had to break the curse and reverse the curse by allowing Jesus to die the death we should have in order for us to have the life he deserves. And in this, Peter begins to recognize, man, God is not a respecter of persons because as Peter is preaching the good news about Jesus Christ to Cornelius and his entire household, now God gives evidence because they received the Holy Spirit poured out just as Peter witnessed on the day of Pentecost. He sees it happen right before his eyes in a room full of Gentiles. And it is that that heals Peter of his prejudice. See, God starts at the top. Watch this, people. I don't care what list you look at in the New Testament. When the list of the disciples is given, Dr. Doss knows this. Peter's name always appears first. Never is it second, third. Peter's name in every list of the disciples, his name is listed first. God starts with the leader. He starts with Peter. When the time came, the same Peter that lied and cursed that he did not know Jesus, this is the man that preaches on the day of Pentecost. You would think God could have chosen someone who was more courageous, but who does he use? He uses the lying, cursing Peter to declare the good news, and thousands are converted in a day. See, God uses the leader, even though the leader is wounded, God uses the leader because God wants to heal the wounded heal. You know, folks, we have to understand this, and it is an indictment of the church when we're still, a deal, we're still dealing with issues that the church should be leading and not following the larger culture. As believers, we are countercultural. We are teaching contrary to the culture because in the culture, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, all of that is not of God. So the church should be leading. It should be a beacon. It should be a lighthouse to those in the sea of life being tempest-tossed. And folks, we have to understand, if we don't get it right down here, uh, you won't be up there. There's no segregated heaven. There's no separate worship services. We're all going to join together on the sea of glass, worshiping the one true Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And God is going to heal all of us of our woundedness. And he uses the vehicle of ministry to heal us. What an amazing God that we serve, that God can even condescend to use us in our brokenness in order to heal us because God is not only desperate to save us, he wants to use us to save others. What an amazing God we serve. And what a beautiful thing. Peter now recognizes that God wants the Gentiles to receive the promise, as was prophesied in the Old Testament, that they are going to be a light to the Gentile. And God uses Peter even before Paul. We recognize Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles. Before Paul begins his ministry to the Gentiles, Paul comes second. God uses Peter first. He uses Peter first. And Peter starts the whole process of evangelizing the Gentiles. And so, folks, even today, 
we have to recognize there are going to be obstacles for us to overcome to reach the people God wants us to reach. And usually that obstacle begins with us. I had the privilege of uh, working as a PRN chaplain for three years there in Lexington at St. Joseph Hospital. And prior to becoming a chaplain, you are required to go through what is called CPE, clinical pastoral education, before you can minister to others. Because as a chaplain, you're not there to proselytize. You're there to minister to the most vulnerable and sick and even dying in the hospital, ministering to them, ministering to their families, and also ministering to the staff. So it's ministry done in a very different way, and it requires particular training so that your theology is broad enough to minister to those who um, are people that you may not have theological agreement with, but you're not there to proselytize. You're simply there to minister to them in the context that is the most relevant to them. So now watch this. As I'm going through, as I'm going through this training, I discover that clinical pastoral education has less to do about the patients. It has less to do about those that I'm there to minister to, and it has everything to do with me. Because what clinical pastoral education teaches you, it teaches you what your issues are. You don't learn about the issues of others. You learn about what your issues are. And it's important because your issues become a stumbling block in doing ministry for others. Because unconsciously, you will project your issues onto others. And so I had to learn how to own my own issues, how to set my issues aside so I could minister to the person right there in front of me. I didn't learn this at Oakwood. I didn't learn this in graduate school. I learned it in clinical pastoral education because that was the requirement before I could go into a hospital and minister in a multicultural, multi-church um, uh, context, multi-theological context. I had to know how to be able to minister to these people and not allow my own issues to become a stumbling block. Bluegrass Community Church, you're in a unique position in a nexus in time. You have been planted there in Lexington, not because God needed another church, but because God needed a different church. God needed a new church. God needed a church that could reach people that traditional churches could not reach. God needed a church whose focus is on the unchurched, the seeker, and that God has planted you there strategically to reach those people. My prayers is that you never lose the identity that God has given you from the beginning. God doesn't need another church. He doesn't need another church like Lane Allen. He doesn't need another church like Lima Drive. He needs someone different to meet people and reach people that Lane Allen and Lima Drive cannot reach. But we have to own our issues, recognize them, turn them over to God so that we too can be wounded healers. And in our ministry, God can heal us of our own brokenness. My commission to you, my, my appeal to Bluegrass Community Church is you allow God to use you to reach people for Jesus, but in the process, heal you of your own brokenness. Hey, the songwriter says, who what the world needs now? is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little love, too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love, not just for some, but for everyone. There's good theology in the lyrics there. 
And I submit to you, God has positioned you and purposed you for such a time as this. May you rise to the challenge in Jesus' name. May you submit and commit yourself to the cause of Christ. May you put your hand to the plow and not look back. For those are not fit for the kingdom of heaven. And may God use you to enlarge your territory so that the prayer of Jabez may be yours. Lord, bless me also and enlarge my territory. I just want to thank God for each and every one of you, and I just want to pray for God to bless you as you continue to enlarge your territory in Lexington. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the Bluegrass Community Church, the church that is there for those who have been marginalized, those who are downtrodden and oppressed, those who don't have a suit and tie, and they use that not to go into the house of the Lord. But this is a church designed to reach those who are the unchurched, a church designed to reach those who are seeking, Lord. They're looking for love, but they've been trying in all the wrong places. I pray this is a church, Lord, that continues to love unconditionally. A church where people can come and be loved and accepted for who they are as they journey to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. May you use Bluegrass Community Church to your name's glory and honor. I thank you for their ministry. I thank you for their membership. And I thank you for those that they will win to the kingdom of God through their efforts and labor and cooperation with the Holy Spirit. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.